Hi, my name is Philip Fercasi, and I'll be reading from my novella Shiloh. The setup on this story is that it takes place during the two-day battle of Shiloh during the Civil War, and is told from the perspective of twin brothers Henry and William, who are fighting for the Confederates and who just want to get home alive. Despite my earlier protestations, William and I are among the scavengers of the second massive encampment. Now that we've taken the ridge and the immediacy of the battle has temporarily waned for our company, I can't begrudge the logic of stopping to savor the spoils of conquest. Besides, we are hungry and the army is in short supply of food. It's impossible to suggest men pass up the bounty found among the tents and fire pits of the Union camp. The river runs in the distance and the fortifications of Pittsburgh Landing by Grant's men stand at the ready. They appear as long, jagged lines scratched into the earth as if drawn there by the Yankee god in dark blue ink. Lieutenants and even a colonel or two attempt to rally our regiment, but all I see are soldiers wolfing down scraps of meat, hardtack, discarded apples. A few of the men are singing, pays, 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 eating goober, pays, as they kick corpses and rummage through bloody blue pockets. One of the volunteers shoots another over a treasure, a clamped pot of stew. The vol is subsequently manacled and taken to the rear, where they'll most likely kill him or set him on his way, marked as a deserter. William finds a sack filled with carrots and bread. We sneak into a hot, dark tent and devour it all, ready to kill anyone who enters without our leave, or, God forbid, makes for our prize. It has truly been a horrifying day. Just past noon and already thousands dead. Most of the wounded have been left among the burning trees or face down in the marsh. Several Union officers' tents of the southern camp have been made into Confederate field hospitals, the tents nothing more than a butcher's meat grinder, the surgeons inside twirling machinations of metal that pull the limping, bleeding, and wounded into the front and spit pieces of men out the back, arms and legs and corpses thrown into an already overflowing ditch dug by other men who will likely soon help fill it, along with my brother and I, to be sure. A thunderclap breaks overhead, but I hardly notice as it fits in so perfectly with the foregoing thunder coming from the river. We've heard word that the gunships are hunkered in beneath the shoreline and can fire at our positions all day and all night without fear of retaliation, and so they have done. The earth constantly trembles, the air is scorched, my teeth vibrate in my head and my ears are near deafened by the constant barrage on the senses. Despite the officers' best efforts, it isn't until we hear the cry of Union bugles and the screams of terror outside our current position that we drop our looting to ready for arms. William and I burst from the tent to a scene from hell itself. Gray uniforms in hasty retreat, running back toward the trees in the first overrun camp. To the northeast, the blues are surging, and our men scramble to form ranks. Muskets! comes the cry, and we fire at will. One of our batteries has pushed up and now blasts straight into the Federals, forcing their lines to stagger. I ram another ball into my barrel and let out a bloody scream. William joins me, and soon other men rally to formation. We walk steadily toward the Union lines that are now pulling away, back toward the sunken road. We push them a hundred yards straight east away from the camp. More grays form a line to the west. We will meet at their heart and we will crush them. Murderous cries come from the right as a line of hidden blues suddenly burst from the trees, bayonets level, and charge our battery. They go for our cannons. The surprise attack shakes us and a few men drop guns and run. I charge. Two companies in total fling themselves against this new Union attack. Without our artillery, we're doomed and we damn well know it. I don't recognize half the men with me anymore and I'm not sure who is giving orders, but instinct takes over and you do what must be done. If a knife is being plunged toward your foot, you do not turn a blind eye. You pull your boot back to defeat the stabbing blow. I fire a shot into the back of a hatless soldier and pause only to fix my bayonet. The field has become a brawl. William runs on without me right into the fray, yelling incoherently beyond my senses I leap into the mix. 
I run my bayonet through the chest of a grizzled Yankee. Something punches the side of my head. My ear pops and rings. My mind flickers and I drop to a knee. I find the strength to gain my feet. I'm deep within the skirmish when my eyes deceive me again. It's a whirlwind of gray and blue. The spurting, showering red of blood is everywhere. A blue coat is strangling one of our battery men who sticks his side mercilessly with a blade. Some Federals are stabbing a horse to death with bayonets. The great beast screams and topples drunkenly onto its side. A Dixie Gray staves off two Union soldiers with the barrel of an empty musket, swinging it like a club, but he is quickly overtaken and slaughtered as he shrieks for mercy. I see all this as if time is slowed, but I also see, as opaque as flesh, the demons running rampant throughout. They leap from man to man, pulling at their substance, their bodies covered in gore and shadow, despite the unfiltered sun overhead. Thunder rumbles again, and I look to the heavens. I squint at a bright light, a pale hole in the sky. The light ignites the skirmish with white brilliance, and the demons evaporate, leaving only the human killers behind to fight. There's a crack so loud it feels the world is breaking, like the dome of sky is snapped in two. The ground shakes and I lose my footing. A few of the fighting soldiers notice the tumult and one gets a saber through the middle when he looks around for the source. A musket cracks and William is thrown backward. Will! I scramble on hands and knees toward him, pulling my knife free of my boot as I do. An old soldier in blood-stained blue stands over him, rams downward with the point of his bayonet, and my brother screams. I snarl and leap at the soldier, jam my blade to the side of his neck, and land atop him as he crumbles. I pull the blade free, and a wash of warm blood shoots from his gouged throat and over my hand and forearm. I spin to William, see his eyes open and searching. A hot bullet has sliced open his scalp cleaner than a Cherokee blade. A flap of skin reveals the dull white of skull above his temple, but I don't see his brain and I thank my mother's soul for this. Far worse than the damage done by the bullet is the stab wound. It punched through his belly below the ribs and sliced sideways, opening his stomach. Dark blood pumps through the slit in his shirt and I know the gash is deep, likely fatal. Ignoring the fight, I round and grip him under the arms, drag him back toward the tree line where the blues had been hiding in wait. Deep enough where he can lay unseen, I rest him in the cool shade of the trees. He coughs, and blood splatters his lips. I kneel beside him, take off my jacket, and hold it to the wound in his stomach, leaving be the scorched bullet trail alongside his head until I slow the bleeding in his guts. There are insects all around, swarms of them. They settle on my perspiring face and neck, buzz in my ears. They land on William's chest, crawl on his eyes, but I can do nothing at the moment except press into his sliced stomach. I can do nothing but think of saving my twin brother's life. Behind me, the battle growls and snaps, explodes and howls, but it is all distant. A memory. If I can't save William, then the battle is irrelevant because it is already lost. Orders are cried out. Lines are reforming. Voices come closer, yelling for me to rank up. Will's breathing is shallow, and he grips my sleeve with white knuckles. I must attend, I say, and pull myself free. I leave my coat. Press on this. I'll be back. Hurriedly, I bury him to the neck, leaves and dirt and mud over his legs and arms. I tuck the musket beneath him, a pile of leaves around his head. If these trees catch fire, you'll need to crawl clear. He nods sickly as I gather my weapon and leave him to the trees, start for the cluster of men closest to me. I turn back once more, can just make out my brother's beard and sun-reddened eyes through the shadowed leaves. A man stands over him. I cry out, begin to break rank, return to his side and protect him, but I pause. This man, this giant, seems to be doing nothing more than studying my brother, his posture passive his head cocked. The massive brute, the tallest I've ever seen, is naked, but somehow not exposed. His skin looks strong as hard leather, beneath which muscles flex and ripple like melting iron. He holds a spear the length and girth of a ten-year-old pine. The tip, a gleaming metal, appears savage, deadly. 
There is a glow coming off him that is near blinding. I can look upon him no longer. My eyes already run wet, my skin hot, my scalp burning. I wipe my cheek with the back of a hand and feel nothing to see it smeared with warm blood. I am shaking with fear that I have turned mad, and I refuse to look back again. Instead, I run toward the men, already pressing forward. <laughs>